I tell my friends I sleep like a baby. I wake up screaming every two hours. <laughs> I am so pleased to be able to introduce to all of you out there an old friend of mine, Jared Bernstein, and I go back at least 30 years. Jared is the chair of President Biden's Council of Economic Advisors. Good to talk to you. Good to see you. A pleasure to be with you. I have uh, very fond memories of uh, being your employee back in the Labor Department, where we worked on uh, some great progressive issues, including raising the minimum wage. Uh, so it's uh, it's good to see you again. We raised the minimum wage even when both houses of Congress were under Republicans. Something oh my that, goodness! Uh, something <laughs> people said could never be done. Uh, but we pulled a rabbit out of a hat then. My first question for you is: uh, What else would you like to see in the economy? And we've got a, a, a GDP that grew 4.9% last quarter. Inflation is down 60% from what it was a year ago. Unemployment under, 40, under 4% for 20 months. I mean, is there anything you would like to see more of or less of? You know, in this job, uh, I find uh, perfection to be an aspiration, uh, not something that you typically uh, accomplish. So we want to see the kinds of trends you just described to persist in a way that continue to reach uh, middle and lower income people. So uh, the maintenance of the strong labor market, which you just described, unemployment below 4% for 21 months in a row, uh, that's a very persistently tight job market. And with inflation down 60% off of its peak, we're now seeing real wage gains. So year over year, real wages are going up. And that's very important because people need stronger buying power. You know, prices are still elevated. So one thing we'd like to see is more progress on inflation. And in fact, we're pushing hard in that direction uh, with some of the components of the Inflation Reduction Act, for example. In terms of those projects, uh, Jared, uh, I mean, let's look at, for example, uh, the major investments, infrastructure, uh, semiconductors, wind, solar, and so on. When do you think that we will be seeing the results of those projects in terms of jobs, manufacturing jobs, good jobs. Yeah, so uh, the answer to that is already, <laughs> uh, but uh, there's a lot more to come. So uh, we've seen a real spike. It's kind of a hockey stick graph that we've put on our blog many times in uh, the construction of manufacturing facilities. You know, Bob, you remember that back in our day, uh, the complaint from the opposition was that if you do public investment, you're going to crowd out private investment. You and I always believed that that was kind of bass backwards. that um, if you do a public investment in areas where there's market failures or untapped demand, you would crowd in, you'd pull in private investment. Exactly. And that's exactly what we've seen in areas of particularly uh, clean energy, uh, electric vehicle production, battery production. And we already have construction workers who are building those factories. Now, that's the first part. So the answer to your question is a couple of years later, those factories come online, they have uh, more permanent jobs. But look, at this point, we have over 40,000 projects going across the country in 4,500 4, different localities. Some of them are still in the uh, kind of architecture blueprint phase. Some of them are you know, uh, actually being implemented. So uh, we, are, we are making that progress. Now, for that progress to actually result in higher wages, you've got to have a tight labor market. Are you worried that the Fed's kind of uh, efforts to keep inflation under, under wraps may be going too far? Well, first of all, let's start with what the tight labor market is doing. I mean, again, when you have an unemployment rate that's been this low for this long, I mean, there are a number of states out there with unemployment in the 2 to 3% range. Um, that tends to give uh, workers uh, more bargaining power, more clout. And that means employers have to bid up uh, pay offers to get the workers they need. And that's what we've seen. We also, and here's another thing that's very, uh, I think, uh, close to your heart, something we've worked on over the years. Uh, we, we've obviously seen a, a lot of union power flexing its muscle. And um, if you put those two together, you see some real worker empowerment here. That's, that's a pillar of Bidenomics, empowering workers. So we have seen uh, really good wage results, particularly for middle and lower paid workers. And now they're beating in, uh, inflation. Uh, so we have real wage gains. Now, in terms of the Federal Reserve, we're pretty careful to respect their independence. And so I try not to get into granular uh, discussions about their interest rate policy. If you listen to uh, Chair Powell, for example, the chair of the Federal Reserve, he talks a lot about um, trying to orchestrate what I think they call a, a soft landing. 
We call that more of a steady, uh, tr a transition to steady, stable growth. And that is what we see in the data thus far. So steady as she goes in that regard. Now, I know you don't want to talk about the Fed. I'm not going to push you on this. Uh, but, <laughs> it, but, but isn't it, uh, isn't it plausible to say we've already, we've already got to basically a 2% uh, rate of inflation? Why, why is it so necessary to keep interest rates so high? You know, last seen inflation uh, headline was 3.7%. Was, uh, uh, that's the CPI, um, and you know that includes gas and housing. But look, for uh, the American people, for families, gas and housing matters. Um, you know, grocery inflation has come down a lot. We'd like to see that. You look at say processed foods. Um, you know, that's still pretty high. Housing still pretty high. Coming down. So a lot of what we have are things moving in the right direction. And in that regard, I probably you know share some of your sentiment in terms of our is the trajectory going the right way? But the Fed, you know, their rules don't say, well, as long as you're moving in the right direction, we're cool. They're, they're talking about getting to the target. And, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, at least from my perspective, I certainly want to respect their independence and not get into any, any you know, kind of critique around that. Of course. Uh, Jared, I, 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 again, I don't want to be a negative, a uh, nabob of negativism, but uh, it does raise a, 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 another question. And that is particularly since I read the, Times Siena poll last week. I was actually shocked uh, that so few Americans would give uh, the economy a kind of a grade of, of excellence or even, even good. Uh, there seems to be a widespread sense of pessimism and negativity. Where is that coming from, in your view? I think it's coming from a number of different places. I've thought about this a ton. So first of all, you know, I try not to talk too much about politics because I stay in an economics lane and there are a lot of people around here who do politics. But I will say one thing. When Governor Bashir uh, won in Kentucky uh, the other night, you know, that's a different poll, right? That's the poll that matters the most. He uh, talked a lot about the role of infrastructure rebuilding a particular bridge uh, in Kentucky that uh, for 100 years had gone unrepaired. And remember, during the prior administration, you know, the Trump always had the infrastructure week that never materialized. It materialized, became kind of a punchline to a joke. So I think if you actually drill down and you ask people about that bridge in Kentucky, that broadband internet that's getting into their neighborhood, making getting online more affordable, replacing those lead pipes with pipes that have healthy drinking water for their kids, lowering the cost of insulin, lowering the cost of, those things, uh, prescription drugs, those things poll at 80 plus percent. Uh, and, you know, lowering the cost of clean energy, a, a $7,500 subsidy for buying a, 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 an electric vehicle. People really like those things. And if you ask them about them, they will tell you. So what happens when you ask them about the economy and you know, what, why does their opinion go south? Some of this, I think, has to do with inflation. Yes, inflation has come down a lot, but prices themselves remain quite elevated. Let me give you a quick example. The gas price was 340 nationally this morning. I know it's higher where you are in California, but 340 this morning across the nation. That is a buck 60 below where it was on some, summer of, uh, of 2022. June of 22 it was north of five dollars. It was five dollars. It came down to 340. That's great movement in the right direction. Pre-pandemic, it was 250. So it was 250, then it went up to five, then it came down to 340. If you're remembering that five, if that's your baseline, you like where we are on gas. If you remember the pre-pandemic price, 250, then we're not down far enough for you. So part of it is people have a reference point uh, that is uh, on, on price levels that's below where we are right now. Now, how do you, how do you get past that? rising real pay. As their buying power goes up, they can buy that tank of gas for the same amount of work that they could before. That's how you solve that solution. And we're moving in the right direction. I, 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 let me just say very, very quickly, I don't think people uh, have the same uh, sharp dichotomy in their minds between politics and economics uh, that you and, and other economists have. I think uh, when people are asked about the economy, what they're really they, what they respond to is, how do I feel about myself and my family and the world right now? And uh, if they're worried about, you know, Ukraine or Israel or right. anything else, it's going to infect their answer. Look, people have been through a ton. The American people have been through a lot. 
there have just been so many of the kinds of factors you just referred to uh, that lead people feeling you know, a lot more shaky. Now here in the Biden administration, especially on the economics team, you know, our assignment has to be uh, you know, keep your head down and continue to deliver, to execute on the president's vision. And we think we're doing that. We think we have the numbers uh, to prove it. Uh, but it, all that happens within a broader context, as you just said. Uh, people have been through a lot. I think as time goes on and as you know, the quality of our work continues to uh, uh, disseminate across the land. You know, I talked about all those projects and all those places. We've talked about the strong economy. We've talked about getting real wages, so buying power is going up. You know, I, th I think those sentiment indexes will improve, but it takes time. Uh, which brings us really to the, the last question I have for you. I've been involved uh, in several administrations, as you have. Uh, the Biden administration is the first one that really is pro-labor, pro-worker. Uh, you know, I, I'm a great fan of Bill Clinton, obviously, and Barack Obama. Uh, but those, uh, those uh, you know, Clintonomics and, and, and uh, Obamanomics, uh, they really were not as worker-centered uh, as Bidenomics. Uh, and am I, am I wrong in this? Uh, do you think that uh, there is a fundamental difference between Bidenomics uh, and preceding democratic economic policies? I think in a couple ways there really are, and I think it's really pretty transparent. So we have the first president who joined a picket line. So, you know, I'm not saying that's all you need to know, because we've done a lot more than that. If you look at the work of the National Labor Relations Board, uh, you'll see some very granular work in terms of uh, granting labor more power. But, you know, yes, we very much think that if labor's flexing its muscle, that's good for them, good for their communities, and good for the overall economy in ways that you and I have referred to in this in this conversation. But I think in trade, it's a particularly good way to draw the distinction you're making. You know, I think a lot of uh, uh, administrations, probably on both sides of the aisle, looked at trade policy through the lens of consumers. If it's helping consumers through lower prices, we ought to do it, it's all good, full stop. The way President Biden thinks about it is that, yes, people are consumers, and that's important. We don't throw that out. There are great benefits of global trade and robust trade flows. But people are not just consumers, they're also workers. And so your trade policy has to be not just consumer-centered, but worker-centered. And we think about that in almost every space we go into. If it's AI, we ask ourselves, what's the worker-centered policy? If it's trade, what's the worker-centered policy? If it's antitrust, how is this you know, affecting working people? And I know, that this middle out, bottom up thing works. If we have a healthy middle class that's getting their fair share of the pie that they're helping to bake, that's good for them, that's good for their community, that's good for the overall economy, it's good for the globe. I think it is somewhat of a distinction. Uh, well, also you, you didn't mention antitrust, uh, and I think that's a piece of it as well. This is a much more activist antitrust administration than we've seen previous democratic yeah. administrations. That's an area where we, we, we very much come at this from the perspective, uh, uh, per perspective of, of worker-centered antitrust. So you may have a company that um, is actually not necessarily using its concentrated power it's monopolistic kind of power. You may not have a company that's using that power to uh, gouge or raise prices. You may be using it to put downward pressure on labor, you know, and that's not okay with us. So we kind of broaden the scope there, again, with a worker-centered uh, policy. Uh, we also uh, haven't talked enough about climate here, and you know, that's another area where we think uh, we can uh, do well by doing uh, good in that space. And so you know, the idea that we can invest in people, domestic production uh, here at home in areas that have been left behind, uh, and do so in a way that's complementary to our climate policy, you know, that's Bidenomics at work. Well, it's a very, very fundamentally different philosophy than previous Democratic administrations have embraced. And I salute you, Jared, to the extent that you are partly responsible for all of this. Uh, the next thing you need to do is do what you and I did 30 years ago and raise the minimum wage. All right? <laughs> uh, get right on that, sir. All right. Uh, Jared Bernstein, thank you so much. Uh, you, my, my pleasure. You are a dear friend, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you.